hundreds of feet below the throbbing financial centers of the world's great cities lie fabulous fortunes, unclaimed. In these vaulted fortresses, millions in cash, in securities, in titles and deeds left by long silent benefactors wait for missing heirs. Unclaimed mansions, rambling suburban estates, secluded lakeside villas, empty because their owners do not know. Waiting keys, waiting deeds, waiting happiness. Acres of exotic country loveliness that could suddenly be yours. Yours. Yes, the truth is, you may be heir to more than this. In fact, you have inherited a world, if you want it. In an ancient book is the legal language that makes you, if you choose, the legitimate heir to an inheritance that defies description. Are you interested in claiming? It is written. This is George Vandeman. Today, It Is Written presents Missing Heirs. One man read this book far into the night and then exclaimed, I must have inherited heaven. You have, friend. It is written that you have. But what and where is heaven? That's the question. We've long associated the future life with a place called heaven. But strangely enough, about all most people know about heaven is that it's up somewhere. You ask the first ten people you meet, and you'll discover that the majority of men and women who've thought about it at all have no clear idea what it is like. To many people, it is only a mixture of fairy story and imagination, with a covering of puritanic boredom that leaves it with little appeal. In fact, the popular conception of heaven is only a little less fantastic than that pictured by a schoolboy who wrote, Heaven has three stories and a basement. The floor is the cloud. God sleeps on the first two floors, and Santa Claus with his reindeer and toys lives on the third floor. And the angels sleep in the basement. The houses are all made of gingerbread, and the rivers are all of different colors. Red, blue, pink, green, orange, that's all. And the teacher commented, Don't those fairy stories help to develop the children's imaginations, though? Oh, yes, friend, no doubt they do. But will the fairy story idea satisfy men and women forced to take an honest look into the future? You see, many think of heaven as a land where disembodied spirits float around in space, or where we sit on wispy clouds playing on semi-material harps forever and ever a place where St. Peter is supposed to go around clanking keys, which are quite material or they wouldn't clank, and letting in whom he chooses through some sort of a gate into the so-called eternal bliss of the saints. Why, friend, could you imagine a more unhappy place to spend eternity than this traditional heaven? Many a successful businessman has arrived at the age of retirement only to find that retirement is what he least enjoys. To him, and to healthy, buoyant people everywhere, the prospect of passing the endless hours of eternity, aimlessly strumming a harp on the edge of a sun cloud, would be simply appalling. These popular conceptions, or misconceptions of heaven, picturing it as a place without purpose, without reality, without activity, 
without anything but endless boredom seem so absurd, so utterly unsatisfying that many good people, intelligent people, have rejected the whole idea of a future life. They prefer to believe that life here and now is either heaven or hell, depending on what you make of it. No. In the word of the living God, we shall discover that heaven is not a ghost land, nor a spook country. It is not a figment of the imagination. It is not a dream. It is not a filmy fiction made of harps and clouds. Heaven, though it hangs yet beyond the reach of our telescopes, is a world as real and as tangible as our own. It's not a story land at all. The place is as real as any of you have ever seen. And the good news is this. You need not wait until our space scientists develop bigger boosters and more powerful thrust. You need not wait for our astronauts to discover heaven. The answers that men so expensively seek are already yours in the word of the living God. Follow me carefully, will you? For this thrilling possibility of a space trip of the ages promises fulfillment in your day and in mine. Long before men with their speediest scientific achievement could be ready for anything but the most primitive space travel. We begin with the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. You've already gathered, this is my favorite. Look, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Now notice, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. No rockets, no oxygen tanks, no space suits. But friend, gravity will be powerless to hold back the King of Glory as he lifts his people through the skies. Oh, I like to think of that trip and what it will be like. Perhaps stops at worlds along the way. And then the tremendous climax as the Savior swings wide the gates of the city and welcomes us home. The city is as real and as literal as any you have ever known. It has a wall. It has gates. It has foundations. The tree of life is there, and there's no night, no death, no pain, and there are no tears. But did you know that heaven, as real and satisfying as it is, is not to be our permanent home? Did you know that? Listen to the words of Jesus in words that you've known ever since childhood. Over here in Matthew 5, Verse 5, listen to this, just two crisp, short lines. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit, what? Ah, yes, you remember. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What a revelation. What a revelation. The meek shall inherit the earth. Yes, we shall not spend eternity on some cloud out on the rim of the universe, or even in heaven, tangible as it is. God gave his son that this world might forever be the home of the saved. The meek shall inherit the earth. Now true, the meek are not in possession of much of it now. Much of it is in the hands of finance companies, but God has promised it eventually to the meek. But someone is asking, Pastor Vanderman, who are the meek? Shall we let this book answer your question? Let me turn back to the book of beginnings. Over here in Genesis 13 gives us the clue. Genesis 13, verses 14 and 15. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, notice the promise, and to thy seed forever. 
Now, all the land that he could see. But Romans, the fourth chapter, the 13th verse in the New Testament, tells us that Abraham was to be heir of the world. But someone says, the Jews are certainly fortunate. Abraham was the father of the Hebrew race. But I'm a Gentile. Where do I come in? Listen to Galatians, the third chapter, and the 29th verse, right here in the heart of the New Testament. Galatians 3.29, And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. There you have it. If you belong to Christ, then you're an heir to the original promise, an heir to this world. Now, this world at present might not be a very desirable gift, I'll admit. But God will give it to his people as a perfect gift, renovated and changed anew. Over here in 2 Peter 3, verse 13. 2 Peter 3, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, see, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. The world is imperfect now, but the great day of the Lord, in that day, the day toward which all creation is moving, the earth will be cleansed, it will be changed, it will be made new. A thousand happy years will have passed quickly. Years spent in a real and literal heaven. Years spent with the Savior. Spent in companionship with the angels and unfallen beings from other worlds. Yes, spent in being acquainted with it, becoming acquainted with the wonders of God's universe. What a day for the scientist. What a day for the astronomer. What a day for the space traveler. And then the hour will come for the space trip of the ages. There'll be no frantic last minute countdown. No hurried repairing of spaceship doors that might leak precious oxygen out into space. No fear of radiation belts. Visualize, if you can, the most unusual drama ever enacted. The entire city, the New Jerusalem, preceded by all of its inhabitants, with the throne of God and with the tree of life, moves safely out into space and begins its long journey. I like to picture it. Moving down through the star line corridor of Orion, that giant cavern of the skies, its destination, Earth. Then will follow the final events in the awful history of rebellion. But out of the ashes of this estranged planet will come a new Earth. And when it is over, the universe will be clean. And God's plan, so long interrupted, at last is carried out. Let me illustrate. In America's early days, we are told, a family lived in their wilderness home on the bleak New England shore. It was a home of their own making, with furniture carved out by their own hands. There were two grown children. One of them was a young physician who was almost constantly away from home, visiting the little towns and isolated settlements along the coast. The other was a lovely girl about 20. Each evening, she would steal away in the quiet of the nearby wooded sections without the family knowing just where she went. To have her quiet devotions alone in nature's retreat, she'd always sing this song. When softly falls the twilight hour, o'er moor and mountain, field and flower, how sweet to leave a world of care and Lift to heaven the voice of prayer. One evening, as she enjoyed her meditation, just as she had completed the first two lines of her little hymn, when softly falls the twilight hour, or moor and mountain, field and flower, a stranger crept up behind her and struck her on the head and fled. She dropped to the ground unconscious. Naturally, when the evening meal was served, the girl was missing. A party went out to search for her. She was found, but remained unconscious for several days. 
The doctor brother was called and an operation was planned to remove the pressure on the brain. When it was completed and she had regained consciousness, what do you suppose she did? You guessed it. Her lips began to move. And she finished the song so abruptly interrupted a few days before. How sweet to leave a world of care and lift to heaven the voice of prayer. Her brain, you see, began to function just where it had left off. Just so. God's plan was interrupted, rudely interrupted. It was delayed but not changed. The song begun in Eden will again be taken up and finished when the earth is restored to its original beauty and man to his original happiness. Remember the word, the meek shall inherit the earth. And if ye be Christ, then are ye heirs. It's just as simple as that. And it will be real. I hope if you get anything out of these words. It'll be the conviction that the home of the saved, the future life, will be real. God is real. Christ is real. And you will be real. Our friends will be real. We will recognize each other. How could it be otherwise? The lovable little personality traits which make for happiness here will certainly not be lost. You remember how Mary stood in the garden blinded by tears on the morning of the resurrection. Through her tears, she could not recognize her Savior. She didn't expect to see him alive. She thought that person was a gardener. Quietly, Jesus spoke just one word, Mary. And the characteristic way in which he said it was unmistakable. Instantly, she responded, Master, Oh, yes, friend, the resurrection will bring changes, to be sure, but they'll be changes for the better. God will take our poor, worn-out, imperfect bodies and make them perfect. He'll make them immortal. Tired, broken, aging bodies, all will be changed. Wonderful news. Would you like to have me read the description that God gives of that new earth? Would you like to see how real and practical and satisfying it will be. Let me turn over here right to the middle of the Bible. Isaiah 65, verses 17, 21, and 22. Listen to the details. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. You see how the Bible fits together, all one message. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Now notice, and they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. Evidently, it'll be an own-your-own-home proposition. And think how satisfying it all will be. Today we build a lovely home for our comfort and the happiness and security of our family. We landscape the grounds and it is not long and till the home has the touch of our personality and love. Yet all too soon the step grows feeble, the brow wrinkled, sickness follows and we die, and the home is left to others. How wonderfully different it will be in the new earth, for there we shall never die. In that perfect world we should not build and another inhabit. Did you know that there will be health insurance as well? Right here in Isaiah, the Gospel prophet again, Isaiah 33, verse 24. Look, Isaiah 33, verse 24, And the inhabitant shall not say, I am sick. The people should, that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. Often the heart chokes up with sadness and even fear when a little child says to his parents, I'm sick. Or when a husband or a wife says, I am sick. But here, there'll be the finest health insurance of all, perfect bodies with youthful vigor that will never diminish. Over here in the 40th chapter, describing this same scene, verse 31, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 
sound appealing. No hospitals, for there'll be no sick. No psychiatrists, for none will suffer with a guilt complex. All their sins will be forgiven, and there will be no fatigue. Oh, friend, I can hardly wait. Can you? Imagination ever so wild could not begin to picture the joys and the wonders of God's glorious new world. No wonder the Apostle Paul breaks forth with the words in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But, best of all, Jesus will be there. Just think of taking hold of a hand and finding it God's hand, the Savior's hand. Just think of walking into a land where there's no death where there's no disappointment, where there is no night. Just think of waking up and finding it home. Listen to this. In the land of famous days, would you give to inherit a land like that? You can, friend, you can, by an act of deliberate choice on your part just now. Shall we pray? Our dear Savior, seal this transaction just now. Thou hast provided, we accept, we dare not do otherwise, for our hearts well up with more appreciation than we can express. Give to every viewer the satisfaction of knowing that his inheritance is secure. In thy name we pray, and in thy name alone. Amen.